Hello everyone and thank you for joining me. Um, this is a presentation that I gave in August of 2023 uh, on our faculty development day um, to uh, talk about some of the issues with AI, something that's been on everyone's mind. And I wanted to record this because I know not all of us can make it through all of the presentations and uh, in the hopes that it will be of some uh, use to you. Uh, my name is Josh Crosby. I am an anthropology instructor at Dale Mabry campus. Um, and I got very interested in this use of AI um, in part as an anthropologist. It was something that I was, uh, you know, just curious about this, this next step of human thinking uh, and cognition, but also as an instructor, um, because obviously this is something that has the potential to be misused. Um, the point of this presentation is not at all to explain how AI works. I am not a computer scientist, nor is it to bash AI. I, I'll talk about it at the end, but I do think it's important. But rather right now, uh, the point of this is to hopefully help our students to avoid um, improper use of it, overuse of it, um, and to make sure that they are still learning uh, and, and engagingly, engaging effectively um, with uh, materials in our classrooms. I'm going to admit a bias right up front here as a social and behavioral scientist. Um, this is probably geared more towards those of us that have things like writing assignments. Um, if you're talking about something like mathematics, I know that that's a, a, a big topic of it and I don't have a ton of help in that regard. I think some of this may help. Some of this definitely will help but not probably as much as it would um, for those of us in anthro or sociology or history or whatever. So to uh, get into it here, um, just a little outline of it uh, that I'll uh, check back in with you um, e each step of the way just to let you know where we are. I don't want this to be too long of a video and waste your time. Um, this uh, video PowerPoint is also posted online on the SharePoint page so that you can use the hyperlinks that I actually have that you'll see in this video to go to different articles and resources for you, okay? Um, so let's jump in. I think many of you are keenly aware of the fact that, you know, AI is, is a, a heck of a tool uh, and that students are already using it and that it does have the potential to it offer issues of plagiarism and things like that. And so it is something that we need to talk about. Um, there are differences in the AI that's out there, chat GPT being the big, big boy on the block. Um, it was actually the fastest growing website or app in the history of the internet. Um, and uh, it came out, it really came out in December of 2022, but it wasn't until kind of January, I think, before people, February, so be beginning of 2023 that people really started talking about it. But whatever people are using, it is, um, you know, many of these things are functioning in the same way. Um, and so these large language models that use predictive text that use all this stuff, um, um, uh, crawling through the internet to, to come up with answers to things. I do think it's important to note that AI is not new. We are already using AI quite extensively before ChatGPT hit the scene. Predictive text is just AI. Um, so when you're typing in Outlook and you say TH and then it goes, thank you very much, you know, and you can just skip to the end of that, that's, that's um, that too. Grammarly, which I know many of us and many of our students use. Um, uh, even um, spell check in Word, that's AI. Um, so what we're talking about here is the next step of AI, certainly, but we are already using AI, okay? And so I think that's important to note. Um, when I uh, kind of started learning about this, I started reading about it and I, I started seeking out, um, you know, help on how I could avoid plagiarism and things like that and, and maintain academic integrity in my classrooms. And one of the first things that I wanted to do is kind of start establishing my students' use of it. And so I had my students um, do an anonymous survey and I did uh, bribe them with extra credit, but it was still anonymous um, at the end of the semester because it really launched uh, in the spring semester. And so I thought, well, this is the very first um, semester that students could have been using it. Let's look at how they are. Um, and so I wanted to show you some of the information that I learned. I had 157 students respond to it. And then I really spent the summer of 2023 doing a lot of readings, um, 
attending some online talks, watching a lot of YouTube videos of professors and what they were finding with it as well. So, uh, asking if they had even heard of it, right? Um, these numbers, by the way, are total responses, not percentage responses, right? Um, so, I mean, a good chunk of them had obviously heard of it. Some of them had not, right? And it had only been out for a few months at that point. I don't think that that is the case any longer. Um, but uh, most of them had actually, you know, were, you know, a lot of them were already pretty familiar with it. Um, had of those that had heard of it, because if they hadn't heard of it, obviously they weren't even using it. 64% um, had used it on a uh, an assignment or an exam or something. You know, even even as I say here, even if it was allowed or encouraged, that's fine. Um, but of those that had heard it, 64%, so two thirds were already using it by the end of the first semester that it was available. Now, one thing that I actually ask them as well is uh, if you've used these AI powered chats, right, would you or somebody else consider it cheating, right? Um, again, it was, you know, 27%, uh, you know, had, let me rephrase that, uh, a same amount that said, yeah, it would probably be cheating. An equal amount said, I don't know. And that's something very important for us as instructors to think about, is that these students need our guidance on this. There is a tool, a resource that is sitting there for them, and they don't know if they can use it or not. And that is a, a problem, right? That is something that we absolutely need to address. I'd also like to point out, obviously, a lot of them said, no, it wouldn't be cheating at all. Because again, this is a powerful tool, and I think many of us are, are finding ways to integrate it into um, the learning process, just like we expect students to use spell check, you know, or, or the library databases. At some point, I think we're going to find more and more ways to integrate this um, in AI. So I'm, I'm not anti-AI. I just, I recognize, I'm kind of middle of the road. I recognize it's got problems, but um, it's a heck of a tool, right? Um, what kind of assignments, right, um, did they have this for? Overwhelmingly, it was like, um, uh, writing assignments, of course, you know, um, and honestly, one of the biggest things that came out is like, what did you use it for? And it was not to write the paper. It was to generate ideas or to look for sources, um, or to look for connections between different things, um, or to say, what sites should I go to? What journals? Uh, should I read what books cover this? You know, that kind of thing. So um, of the students using it, uh, um, again, I, I can't say that they were completely honest with me. I, you know, I made it completely anonymous, but um, overwhelmingly it was not just like, some people just said, like, I just made it write my papers for me. There were some of those. Um, others, though, were using it, again, as kind of a resource and not just um, straight up plagiarism or cheating or whatever you want to call it. Um, what was the quality of it, right? Um, 86% said that it was mostly or highly effective as to what they wanted. So again, that's going to encourage use, we have found, because if they use it once and it kind of sucks, they're not going to go back. But, you know, over three quarters of them said that it was mostly or highly effective, meaning, okay, those students have now learned that they have another uh, tool in their toolkit. How likely are you? Uh, you know, 40% said somewhat or very likely um, uh, to use it in the future, right? Um, so that's, you know, a pretty good chunk. Um, uh, and so we'll kind of have to see how that plays out. I think that that number is going to frankly go up as students get more familiar with it. Uh, do you think it's important for professors to use it? 40% said yes, it is, it is important somewhat or very important for um, professors to use it. Again, I think that young people are noticing, uh, um, students are noticing that this is, you know, the tools that are gonna be used in the 21st century. Uh, some comments, at the, and then I asked them just to give me some general comments about it, um, is that they um, often made comments that they, as I've mentioned, that they think it's really important. They said that, I know it has issues, 
I hope my professors teach me how to use it because I think it's helpful, but I don't know if I'm using it right and things like that. Um, they, they overwhelmingly really reached out for guidance. And, and I think that goes back to uh, what I said before about, you know, students not even knowing if it was cheating to use it and stuff like that. Um, a lot of students talked about um, really needing um, a, a, a guiding hand to understand this thing, how to use it, what its capabilities are, what its shortcomings are, things of that nature. So let's talk about uh, some of the problems with detection software really quickly here. I think most of you have at this point heard that detection software is just not um, the best thing. Um, the, the, the reality is um, it's the, the detection software is not very effective at this point um, of catching it. It can, it can uh, at times, but it can also give you false positives. And I, for one, am very uncomfortable with the idea of accusing a student of something very serious like academic um, dishonesty like plagiarism when they haven't done it. I think that that's going to potentially really hurt them uh, in their educational career and it's going to really damage my relationship with my student. And so I am not particularly comfortable with these. Um, I think that they're again a resource if we think someone used AI. Um, I have told my students I will run it through three um, AI detection programs and if two of the three say it is, then we're going to have a conversation, right? Not necessarily that I will completely trust it, but just that we will have a conversation, okay? Uh, and so, you know, this is this has been happening. I'm sure some of you have seen these articles that, um, and, and I've seen a lot of things on message boards of, you know, um, um, Reddit and TikTok, Snapchat, um, you know, 4chan, where students are reaching out to other students going, hey, I got accused of this thing and I didn't do it. I didn't use AI. Um, how can I prove it? Right. Uh, and so, excuse me, my apologies. I do think it's kind of a serious problem that we need to to be very, very careful about. And what we're going to talk about next is the fact that I think a better way to address this is by building assignments where it's more difficult to use AI rather than hoping AI detection uh, can make up for those shortcomings. With that said, um, there is, uh, um, from everything that I have read, these are the most highly sort of rated um, uh, AI detection software programs out there. Um, um, I, again, I've posted this PowerPoint so that you can just kind of go to these. Um, the, the these sites if you'd like to check them out the originality one uh, all of these are free except that but it's uh the one that people really report the best um uh you know i i don't know if that's something that someone wants to pay for right out of their own pocket uh, i don't believe that there's any kind of resources from the college to do that um, but i just wanted to mention it that that is the most popular um, Turnitin on Canvas does have um, AI detection. I haven't really heard much about its quality. Um, I've been using it and I don't know that I can really speak to that either at this point. Um, but if you, you know, don't know how to use Turnitin on Canvas, I highly encourage it. Uh, I know some professors feel that it's intrusive and an invasion of a student's privacy and it, it builds a relationship where you come in saying, I don't trust you. I respect that and I do understand that philosophy. I do use it because I find it very helpful and I find it um, discourages students from just out and out, you know, plagiarizing or buying a text or what's I find super common is, you know, um, a couple of friends taking the class and then just sharing each other's papers, you know, things like that. So, um, it, but it is on there, you know, uh, and so that's one resource that we can use, right? Um, spotting AI papers, right? Um, uh, just when you're reading a paper, or trying to spot it. Uh, AI writing tends to be very repetitive uh, because it kind of just comes up with this list of ideas. The first paragraph, second paragraph, third paragraph tend to be the exact same thing, just reordered. I know, however, that you know a lot of our students who maybe 
didn't do all the readings, their papers look a lot like that too, right? Uh, but if it's highly repetitive, they've got like three points and they just keep rearranging how they're stating that, that's one of the things that AI does often. Um, AI writing is often very general. Uh, the way I like to say it is AI is amazing at writing a Wikipedia entry, right? That overview of like, what is psychology? <laughs> you know, or, um, you know, you know, why do, you know, whatever, you know, like what, you know, what caused World War II, right? That, that intro before it gets into the meat of it, um, AI is really good at that, but it's not really digging in much past it. You can ask it to through repetitive queries of, of getting it to drill down, but that becomes much, much, much more difficult if you don't know what you're already asking for in a lot of ways, right? Um, it also, this is what a lot of researchers are calling hallucinations. It just makes stuff up, right? And so it, it will say just very odd things that are inconsistent, um, with reality of, um, it will, it'll say things like, you know, when the U S entered world war one, um, Israel was already a part of the conflict. It's like, well, Israel wasn't even a country then. It, that's an example that someone used online that they found it doing. Um, and things like that. And so, you know, just reading those papers and like, if something comes out of left field uh, and has just nothing to do with anything else, uh, that can be part of the problem too. Because of, again, AI is not intelligent in the way that we think of it. It is basically just predictive text, um, you know, in a very, very fancy way, but that's why it hallucinates quite a bit. Um, there is some argument that actually as people publish more of these hallucinations, they will become more likely because AI will then find those on the web. I don't know. Uh, another thing is to check the metadata. Uh, and so I have an article that is going to talk about this more in depth than wasting your time here. But basically, um, um, the copying and pasting these things now, uh, some of them actually have you could think of it like a watermark for print. And so if you go into the file itself, uh, obviously this doesn't work if students are handing in a print copy, but if they are posting it on Canvas, like I think most of us have now, the metadata in that will sometimes say generated by chat GPT, right? And so there's an article on here that in the next slide that'll show you. Um, and so that, that can be a good thing to check as well. Um, other common mistakes, uh, overuse of the word the, it, and is, because those are such common words in English and it's using a, a, a sophisticated uh, predictive text model, it, it will throw those in there when they're really not appropriate. It will have no typos, no abbreviations, no slang, no colloquialisms, none of that. And while we encourage our students not to have that, I think we all know they have a lot of that. <laughs> and so, you know. Um, that's, that's one, right? And so these, these three articles, uh, uh, talk about a lot of these things, uh, of spotting it and stuff. But I will say that, um, so far, um, human spot AI written generated papers at a level that is consistent to just random chance. So we're not particularly good at it at, that's, at this point, right? But these are some of the things that can indicate to you potentially if um, maybe you want to look into that paper a little bit more. Uh, and so let's talk about some actual techniques here. Right? One, set expectations and acceptable use of AI. As I mentioned earlier in that survey, a lot of students don't even know if they can use it. Um, you need to have a policy I would strongly encourage you to put it on your syllabus. There is actually a number of syllabus statements that are on SharePoint now uh, that I have collected from other institutions and uh, I have links to some of those things. It's on SharePoint and these include like statements of like, yes, you can absolutely use it, you know, all the way to no, you can never ever use it whatsoever to you can use it in this situation or for these things, right? I understand that a lot of professors have different feelings on this and you have that academic freedom. And so there's a lot of different statements on there, but you need to set those expectations and to let them know, um, you know, what is and is not going to be okay in your classroom. Another thing that I would really emphasize, even if you want students to use it, 
you know, and certainly if you don't want them to use it, is explain the shortfalls of it. When this first came out, I think many of us heard the gloom and doom. Uh, people saying that we're going to have 40% unemployment in a year because AI will do everything and, and it's going to be the end of society. And uh, even a, a great scholar who was one of the first people that worked on AI was like, we need to ban this and stuff like that. Um, uh, I, I think that all of those were a little bit hype <laughs> um, and, and time is proving that. Um, I also think that um, uh, you know, people maybe overstated its abilities, right? AI will make up fake sources. I actually got it to do this by asking it to generate um, uh, a, a literature review on topics that I have done research on for like my PhD. And I actually got it to make up a fake article from my dissertation advisor because I know his work very well and he never wrote a paper like that. Um, uh, and, and a lot of people have done that actually, they've, they, it's just made up a bunch of things, right? And so explain that you can show them examples of that. They're all over the web, right? And say, you know, it's going to make up stuff. It's going to, you know, pretend, you know, in terms of sources. And it might even do these hallucinations where it just makes up utter nonsense. And it, it talks about, you know, as an anthropologist, it talks about some culture that lived in, uh, the Amazon and it's like, they're lived in Southeast Asia. What are you talking about? You know, um, that it has these repetitive ideas that it really doesn't have, um, depth that it doesn't have specificity, right? That it comes up with that general Wikipedia overview and then it just keeps repeating it over and over again. Right. So I think explaining those shortcomings is very important whether you want your students to use it or not. Um, let's talk about crafting some good assignments here and assessments to avoid um, maybe the overuse of it. What AI does poorly uh, and thus how you can craft your questions. It does not do well with like nuanced relationships between variables, right? And so comparing X and Y and the relationship between say, um, uh, race and ethnicity with public health or education levels um, with uh, child raising practices, whatever. I'm sure you can think of examples in your field. It doesn't really do that well, right? To understand things that are maybe not 100% clear um, uh, and, and you kind of have to think through a little bit, right? Revisions in the writing. Process. So, you know, uh, uh, saying like, hey, I'm going to do corrections, right? You turn in the first draft, we go through it, that kind of thing, right? Self-reflection. Obviously, it doesn't know how to do that. Personal experiences. Uh, this is something I do a lot of. Hey, we're studying this thing. Tell me how this relates to your major. You know, um, tell me how this is going to affect your career path, this idea of X, Y, and Z, you know. Um, and so making it very personal means that, um, you know, it, it, it just becomes much more difficult for it to come up with anything, right? Um, another thing that I have done is say, um, hey, give me, you know, pick two quotes from this chapter, you know, that are one to two sentences long and tell me why you think those are really important ideas. Again, a lot of these things you can, with enough work, get ChatGPT to do it. But it requires so much work and the, the crafting of prompts and the re-entering of prompts and the asking for clarification that, um, you know, you could get it to do it, but it might just be easier for students to do the assignments, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so asking for them, like, you know, from that chapter, right, or from that article, give me two quotes from it and, you know, whatever. Analysis of visuals, video, and other multimedia. Honestly, this is probably something that in the coming years it will be able to do, but it currently can't. And so it's basically just kind of going through print things on the internet, right? And so if you're putting up, say, in a, a 20th century history class and you've got examples of, you know, propaganda posters used in the U.S., Russia, Germany, and asking students to compare them, Chat GPT will not be able to do that at all, right? There, there's nothing that it can do about it. Or looking at advertisements or um, things like TikToks. Um, I know there's a lot of people that sort of, um, you know, poo-poo it, but the truth is um, young people are already using TikTok and there's a lot of scholars on TikTok and there's a lot of information on TikTok that's really great. There are numerous um, um, highly accomplished scholars 
on TikTok or for that matter, Instagram or, you know, those kinds of things um, that are posting to try to disseminate knowledge about their field and their discipline that I think you'd be surprised at the quality of them if you just do a little bit of research. And um, not only can AI not do that, I'll also add as an aside, I have found that students get really, really excited about that. Um, when I ask them, instead of just reading the same old article, like find me a tick, you know, find me this YouTuber, look at this YouTuber or find a YouTuber or whatever that's talking about these topics and, you know, do whatever with that, that work. Um, they get really excited. I, I find when you do that, right. Um, sustained analysis of a long text, um, typically book length, it doesn't do well. Um, but, um, you know, it can be a little bit shorter. Again, that's probably more for those of you in the English or the literature side of things. Uh, but AI doesn't do great with like that continued analysis again, instead of just the intro, but yeah, uh, analysis, obviously based on lecture or discussion, right? Um, we talked about, uh, X, Y, and Z last week in class. How does that shape your understanding of one, two, and three, right? Those kinds of things um, are really, really helpful, right? Or, or saying, you know, looking through the discussion board posts, what were the most effective strategies that you found, whatever, right? Uh, analysis of recent events. And again, this is another one that will continue to change. Um, I believe the chat GPT model, it went, uh, it was built around, um, information that was only as current as maybe 2019 or 2021, I can't remember now. Um, and so things that have happened since then, it doesn't really have a record of. And so if you're in a political science class, you know, maybe uh, the recent election of or the recent uh, uh, Speaker of the House or the whatever, you know, or um, this recent social movement or this recent, you know, whatever things that are happening right now. Again, there's also a lot of research data, I'm sure you, you many of you know, that doing that is also more, way more engaging with students because they're like, man, I, I've heard about this and people are talking about this and somebody else mentioned this and it just kind of fires them up that it's relevant. It's right now rather than, you know, uh, oh, analyze this thing that happened in 1971, which might as well be like the sixth century to them. Right. Uh, so so that that, you know, focusing on recent events. Uh, engages students more, and it prevents AI from really um, doing much with it. Um, another way, another uh, good technique is to basically um, track changes. And there's an article, this article right here actually explains it, whether you're using like uh, Google Docs or Microsoft Word or Apple Pages, right? Um, basically it, 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 it's saying that you can use track changes to try to, um, be able to go back and look, um, to see if students were working on this over time, if they were correcting it, if they were spell checking it, all of those kinds of things compared to if they are just copying and pasting out of AI, you are going to see blank document. And then one second later, there is, you know, 3000 words and they are perfectly formatted and there are no typos and there are no abbreviations and there's no, you know, so, um, this is a good way to do it. I highly recommend you check out this, um, this, uh, article on it. Again, this is just from that article. I won't waste your time in going through it. If this is a technique that you would like to use, uh, just check out that article. And the same goes for, uh, for these. Another thing that can be really helpful, and I know that this is more limited now since post um, COVID-19, you know, many of us are seeing that a majority of our classes are now online. Students moved online and students like being online. Uh, however, if you do have an in-person classroom um, is the idea of flipping the classroom, which is the idea that, um, to put it simply, is that, you know, in the classroom, you're lecturing, talking, explaining, demonstrating, and then they go home and they're doing an activity. They're writing a paper. They're solving those problems, right? The idea of flipping the classroom is have them go home and record your lecture just like this, just like so many of us had to do during um, quarantine. 
and then have them come in and do those quote unquote homework activities with you in the classroom, whether it's math problems or it's a writing assignment or, you know, a discussion board post or whatever it is, uh, instead of you lecturing, right? There's some really great resources, um, out there. Uh, this is, uh, um, um, information from the University of Washington. The book that I read that really um, opened my eyes to this was Flip Your Classroom. I highly recommend it. You can find it on uh, Amazon for pretty cheap. Uh, and I think it's a, a heck of a technique. It gets way more in depth than just this kind of simple thing. And it gives examples uh, in different settings and different situations and stuff like that. Uh, and so I'd encourage you to check it out. Another thing you can do is break up the writing assignment, right? Um, rather than by the end of the semester, you're going to turn in a, you know, 10 page paper to me. It's like, okay, you know, this date, you're going to give me a topic and a thesis. And then this day you're going to give me academic sources. And on this day, you're going to give me a bullet pointed outline. And then on this day, right. And so however you choose to break that up, first draft, second draft, final draft, whatever it is, um, again, AI does very well writing a complete thing. It does not do as well. Um, which is not to say it's impossible, breaking up a writing assignment. Like, write me half a paper. <laughs> you can convince it to do that in ways, or you can get it to write you a whole paper and then, like, delete parts of it and stuff like that. Again, this is not going to be foolproof, but any step that you can add to students being able to use AI effectively uh, as a cheating tool is going to encourage them to, you know, be a little more honest about it, right? And again, there's some there's some uh, resources there for that. Um, one of the most important things that I have found is just asking very detailed and specific questions. So I spent a, a good part of the summer just um, messing with AI and playing with different AI softwares and things and taking all of my test questions and throwing them in there and stuff like that. Um, very general questions. Um, are quite easy for AI, obviously. And so things like uh, I show my students a film um, and, you know, what were the major findings of Napoleon Chagnon's work among the Yanomamo, which is a culture in South America and the Amazon? AI gave me a perfect answer to that question. Um, it was absolutely perfect. Um, I'd give it an A every day. But I kind of restructured it and said Napoleon Chagnon claims that white daddy or fierceness is important to understanding the behavior of the, the Yanomamo. What events led him to this conclusion? How does that characteristic shape their culture and behavior? This, it clearly did not understand what to do. It, it was just, it, it gave me basically the same answer as before. Like the Yanomamo live in the Amazon. And I was like, that's not, you know. And so really specific, really specific, really specific is going to be um, much, much better um, uh, um, a, a way to craft these things. Again, the same is true of sort of um, uh, multiple choice questions of, you know, um, you know, which primate has the largest body mass like that, just like Google. I mean, in that way, you know, so it's going to be really easy for those. Um, another thing that's really important is, um, uh, is, you know, hands-on learning and engaged projects. And so one of the things that I've done is had my students do like quote unquote field projects where, um, they either have to go to the zoo or they have to log onto websites that have live camera feeds on like gorillas or chimpanzee enclosures when we're talking about primates and human evolutionary history. And I say, okay, you have to watch this for an hour, describe, you know, these different criteria that we go through and, and all of that, you know, that, that you see them doing and, you know, um, that makes it much more difficult. Now, yes, you can, again, convince um, ChatGPT to fake that, but it's actually much more difficult, I find, right? Um, especially because a lot of times students don't quite know what they're looking for. Uh, and so they can't say, well, I didn't, I saw the, the chimpanzee zoo X and Y, but not Z. Whereas ChatGPT just says, well, they can do all those, you know. Um, or having my students like, uh, you know, pick, I'll, I'll have them pick a family member. I go, go to their social media and take 20 posts, right? Um, uh, you know, 
what's their age, how many times, what kind of information are they sharing, what kind of slang terms do they use, what kind of, you know, and we talk about like language use and sociolinguistics among generations and things like that. Um, that's not really something that this is going to be great at, right? And so those kinds of things, that hand on, hands-on, the engage projects, stuff like that, um, are an excellent, excellent way to prevent kind of the overuse of AI. Um, you know, especially for online learners, though, I know that many of these things might not always work. So two resources that I want to talk about is the um, Association of College and University Educators, AQ, through um, CITT. Uh, I'm in the middle of my third class right now. Uh, they have a four, uh, four class sort of modality that uh, guides you through like really best practices for online teaching. Uh, if you have not taken these courses, I cannot recommend them enough. They're wonderful, wonderful courses that really give you a lot of information about connecting with your students and making good assessments and engagement and stuff like that. And again, the more engaged we are with our students, the research has found that we are much more likely to uh, not have issues with plagiarism or cheating or stuff like that uh, when students like their professors, when they respect them. Um, they don't want to let them down, right? And so, I think that's an important part of this as well. Uh, another wonderful book that I uh, really enjoyed is Small Teaching Online. Uh, I found this really um, helpful, um, you know, educators, again, talking about kind of the best practices, building community, uh, building connection, highly recommend the book. Again, you can find used copies on Amazon for pretty cheap. So, um, Lastly, I want to talk about kind of using AI in the classroom. I do think that's important for us to acknowledge that this is going to be the tool of the 21st century. I think that we do need to integrate it. I think that our students want us to, and I think that they need us to, because many, many jobs now, I don't think they're being replaced by AI. Uh, some might, but you're going to be able to use this as a um, you're going to need to use this for productivity and efficiency in the same way that every single human being that has a job now that requires math in that job they're going to use a calculator and so you know i'm i'm not a math professor and i don't want to make my colleagues mad at me right but you know back in the day saying like well these calculators you you, you know you can't use them well the reality is knowing how to use a scientific calculator properly is a skill that students need right um, I think knowing how to use AI, whether they're doing coding or whatever else, I think knowing how to use it properly and spot its limitations is also going to be an important skill. So I think that we need to limit our students uh, using this tool improperly, but I don't think that we need to just say, well, this is evil and it should be banned. I'd also like to point out as an anthropologist who's done archaeological field work, no technology in the history of human beings has ever been banned, not once. Um, I mean, nuclear secrets got out, right? Uh, 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 I'm sure we've all heard stories. There's guys that have built like uh, nuclear reactors in their backyard shed. <laughs> you know, no one has ever banned, it, banned, frankly, anything, whether it's a technology or a behavior or an idea or whatever else, right? Uh, so this idea that maybe we shouldn't be, you know, like we, we should just get rid of it. We're not going to be able to. That's not how these things work. Um, likewise, I know some people are like, well, maybe we shouldn't talk to our students about it because we don't want to, you know, whatever. Uh, again, when this thing had only been out a couple of months, uh, a good chunk of my students had already heard of it. And it has only gotten more popular since then. Right. There are movies and TV shows that are referencing this now. There are podcasts. There are YouTubers that are making content on it. There are TikTokers that are making content on it. They know about it, right? The cat is out of the bag. You cannot, um, you cannot defuse the bomb after it's gone off. There, uh, here's just some other kind of general resources for um, everyone, um, you know, that I have found really, really helpful um, about AI and teaching and things like that, that I wanted to put out there that you can just kind of read through at your uh, convenience. Um, as I said, the PowerPoint is posted in um, SharePoint so that you can just click the link on there. 
And so I want to thank all of you. I hope that this was helpful. If you have questions, please feel free to email me. Again, my name is Joshua A. Crosby. It's jcrosby20 at hccfl.edu. Um, feel free to reach out. Feel free to send along uh, advice or tips. Uh, if you have questions, I'd love to answer them. I'm not an expert, I admit, uh, but just really curious about this. And if you find some really excellent resources, please don't hesitate to send them to me. I'd, I'd uh, love to have those uh, in my toolkit as well. Thank you all so much.